Uh, welcome, everyone. I'm Fred Kemp. I'm President and CEO of the Atlantic Council, and it gives me great pleasure to introduce this event uh, with uh, a man uh, I've uh, respected, whose views I've respected on many things, including the uh, world of energy, uh, the world of uh, uh, industry in the UAE, and larger questions as well. Uh, so this is, uh, th so thank you for tuning into our conversation with the Minister of Energy and Industry for the United Arab Emirates, His Excellency Suhail al-Mazrui. Uh, His Excellency is an important partner uh, for the Global Energy Center and to the Atlantic Council as a whole, as well as uh, to the co-host of this event, the US UAE Business Council, and thank you to that council and to Danny Seabright, my friend and its leader. Um, in January, uh, the minister and I had a discussion about the UAE's energy strategy and diversica diversification investments. A lot's happened since there, then, Mr. Minister, and I'm excited to talk to you again today, as are uh, others in this very large virtual room, global room, uh, looking forward to listening to. This is a timely conversation. We know what's happened in oil markets this year one of the most volatile years, a really historic year in oil markets. The UAE played an, an, a very big role in calming things down. But even more importantly, from your perspective, you were there right from the beginnings of OPEC Plus. And in fact, you were the president of OPEC uh, in the year that the charter was signed that made it a more permanent fixture. So we look forward to listening to you on all of that. As oil demand collapsed, uh, you were one of the leading voices calling for OPEC Plus to cut production and stabilize the market. Just recently, the UAE announced that it would be voluntarily cutting production beyond the requirements of the OPEC Plus deal to help oil markets recover further. With the latest OPEC Plus meeting just over a week ago, there could not be a better time to hear from the minister. Now, before we begin, as this event is entirely virtual, if you're interested in asking questions during the question and answer period, please submit them using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. I also want to note that we have invited some of our closest Atlantic Council and US UAE Business Council friends to join the uh, conversation as respondents. Uh, I want to thank Danny Seabright, my co-moderator today, and the US UAE Business Council for their collaboration on this event. I'll now hand it over uh, to Danny uh, to kick us off. Thank you, Fred. I really appreciate the partnership today with the Atlantic Council. Uh, could not be more uh, pleased and proud to uh, host His Excellency, uh, uh, Minister Mazrouri, for this very, very important and timely event. This is the latest in the Business Council's webinar series, Looking Ahead, Conversations with U.S. and UAE Business and Government Leaders. And we are absolutely uh, thrilled to be able to highlight uh, latest developments in this vertical and sector. The minister will make a number of remarks, but he's going to say a few words about COVID-19 and the response that the UAE has I think the latest ranking has the UAE in the top 10 as, as countries that have responded the most positively to COVID-19. We are so happy, Mr. Minister, that you uh, and your country have been able to, to respond in such a, a positive and wonderful way for the safety and security of not only your citizens, but all of those who live and work in the UAE today. With that, if I could just introduce the other panelists uh, that will be with us today, and then we'll turn it over, I'll turn it back to Fred for his opening remarks uh, and his first question to the minister. If uh, we could ask Am Ambassador Paula Dobriansky, former U Undersecretary at State, Atlantic Council Board Member, and Vice Chair of the Scowcroft Center for Strategy and Security to join the webinar. We could ask Halima Croft, Managing Director at the Global Head of, and, of Community Strategy at RBC Capital Markets and, the, and, and also an Atlantic Council board member to join the webinar. We have uh, two close friends and members of the Business Council and of the Atlantic Council, Sandy Lowe, Group Chairman, Middle East, Occidental Petroleum, and Chris John Lenoble, Lead Country Manager for ExxonMobil. If you could all join the webinar 
uh, very much. We, we appreciate having you on today uh, to participate in this very, very timely event. Uh, if I could, uh, back over to you, uh, uh, Fred, uh, and take it away, please. Thank, thank you so much for that, Danny. Um, uh, so Your Excellency, uh, we've been working uh, together now uh, for uh, five years. It will be the fifth annual Atlantic Council Global Energy Forum in Abu Dhabi. We're looking forward to that. The reason I mention this is we've seen a lot of change. We've seen a lot of history. You were the, in there at the beginning of OPEC+. Plus. Tell us how important the oil production uh, cuts were this year from a historical standpoint, when you actually bring the U.S. into the decision. Give us also a feeling of how durable you think these latest cuts are. How do you hold people to account? And, uh, and, and, and not to overburden this first question, but can you, can you give us some sort of feeling of how you think this might play out uh, throughout the rest of the year? Uh, sure. Uh, first of all, good morning to uh, to all of you from uh, our colleagues and uh, friends from the U.S. and whoever is joining us from here. Uh, it's a great uh, pleasure and uh, to uh, to work again with the Atlantic uh, Council virtually and with collaboration with the uh, U.S. UAE Business Council. Uh, the uh, as you know, the whole world. Is, have been uh, facing this pandemic uh, in uh, in an unprecedented way. So the uh, the oil market got uh, got distorted by the uh, by the lack of travel and the lockdowns of, of the countries, and we have uh, seen we have shifted from growth, which was uh, the the norm uh, that the the growth and demand was shifted to, to, to a decline and a very rapid decline. That decline reached uh, almost 10 percent of the, of the uh, during the first the first month or so of the, uh, of the pandemic. So uh, at the beginning of the, uh, of, the uh, of the deal or before the deal, there was no deal. And I think I think what what happened during the OPEC and non-OPEC had uh, led us to uh, to uh, a very uh, critical moment where all of the countries rethought about the about this group, and I think it brought us back stronger. So if it wasn't that we didn't agree, maybe we will not cut the largest ever in the history of the oil industry cut that any country I've seen. Countries uh, who are the participating countries have cut up to 23% of their production. And uh, as you know, it wasn't easy. We have seen as well a sharp fall on the, on the prices, which hurt every economy on, the, uh, on, on, uh, on Earth, especially those who are relying on, uh, on hydrocarbons. Fortunately for us in the United Arab Emirates, uh, dealing with the pandemic was uh, was quite uh, a challenge for us, but but we learned quickly from some of those uh, nations that we have an excellent relationship with, and who have been uh, who have got the first wave, and we responded with a plan, which was followed thoroughly by the the people in the UAE. We have committed while we are dealing with the problem to help others as well. So if you don't mind, I'll, I'll spend a minute talking about what we did at the beginning. We decided that we will pay lots of care to everyone who is here. And we will not dis distinguish between our nationals or whoever is living in the UAE. So the leadership took that call. And we managed today to test more than any country in the world with a population of more than 1 million. I think we reached 2.6 million for a population that is less, less than a 10 million uh, people. So that's almost testing 26% of the population. And I don't think anyone has done that. At the same time, we did not share, we would not do, our leadership did not spare an effort in helping other nations. We helped around 65, 64 countries around the world who were in need and got, who got shocked uh, by this pandemic. And uh, 
we uh, we stepped to the challenge and we helped those friendly nations and and, and friends who were in, in great need. And it's it's a time where uh, where a friend will will step in for a help if they can. So we are uh, proud of what we have done so far, and uh, and I think we are in a good trajectory to deal with this with this pandemic in a very professional way. When it comes to the deal itself, uh, Fred, uh, it was very important for us to size uh, the uh, the cut to the requirement because we didn't do a mediocre job in just cutting something that will not do the job. That's why the we targeted a 10 million barrel, which was, as I said, the, the forecast for the demand destruction was in that range when we met. And we said we need also other nations to help, especially from the US to Canada to other, uh, to other ministers. The role that the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia which have been a leading partner in the OPEC Plus together with Russia, was detrimental in making this deal a reality. Uh, they, they were the first to, uh, to, to come together and agree to, uh, to cut this 23%. And after that, we got together and we've been working together with Saudi Arabia in, uh, in the shade, trying to call every minister and trying to convince everyone that we need to have the sacrifice to save this industry. We're not talking about a price that is good for us. We're talking about, uh, the, our, about saving families, saving, uh, saving jobs, in the, especially in the US. And the US, as you know, has a, uh, a, uh, a relatively more expensive producers than many nations here in the Middle East would, would feel the, the heat first. And uh, uh, distorting that industry, which took lots of efforts and lots of capital as well, was not something that we, uh, I think we can, the world we can live with without, without the shale oil production. It's needed production and uh, we needed to do something. And the, uh, the call for the G20 ministers after uh, after the second day of making the deal, to also uh, take a commitment from many countries was also a, a, a reassuring step that, that the Saudi, Saudi Arabia uh, have done and coordinated. And uh, I think that the, these steps led to the solidarity of the whole producers to having this deal. Since we have done the deal, and as as analysts, we're predicting that this year is going to be a year between $10 to $20, if we are lucky, to maximum, maximum $30. We have seen within a month of uh, committing to the deal a, uh, that the prices went back to, uh, to almost uh, uh, reached 20, uh, $43 for Brent and, and, and $38 to very close to $40 for WTI. And that was a dream that was forecasted to, to happen next year. And uh, following this, the questions came to us, is everyone going to be committed? Are we going to have countries who are not going to 100% fulfill their, their, their cut or their conformity levels? And I think the, uh, the assurance that we got in the latest uh, meeting that every country is not only willing to, to commit to do their cut, but also to compensate for any uh, shortfall in, uh, in cutting in May or in June. And uh, I think, I, think the, uh, I am more uh, now uh, assured by my fellow ministers uh, and the JMMC is going to happen soon to follow up. But I think the assurance that we got and uh, the, uh, the benefits that these countries have seen uh, have, have been a great uh, demonstration of, uh, of, the, of what OPEC Plus can do. Again, the, uh, this group is not a, uh, this is a permanent group in my, in my, in my view. And, and without, people were questioning, do, re do we really need this group? And no one was predicting that a pandemic would come and shake the world economy and shake this industry. But when it came, I think everyone was calling us 
please do something please meet and including the role of uh, of uh, the uh, us president president trump in trying to uh, to uh, to call for saudi arabia and for uh, for russia and for other nations as well to uh, to uh, to meet when mexico had a problem also the united states stepped in and helped mexico to uh, to uh, compensate for uh, for that cut that that uh, mexico had to do so i think i think it has demonstrated that we need each other and we need to uh, to work together i hope i answered the question uh, Mr. Minister, thank you. Yes, you have answered the question very well. Let me pivot, if I may, to the question of what comes next. Um, this is critical to all of the companies and businesses uh, in the U.S. that are your partners and work closely with you. Um, the, your policy of in-country value, um, your policy of digitization, the UAE is a leader with regard to AI, the Internet of Things, 3D printing, and robotics. Can you spend a few minutes talking, please, telling the audience how the UAE will partner with U.S. companies, U.S. partners uh, going forward to create more value, to create more uh, uh, capability, and to create the cutting edge that will transform this industry and this vertical in the future? Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. I think I think for every nation uh, after the pandemic, the world will be slightly different, and, and, and for for some countries, going to be significantly different. Uh, what we learned during this pandemic that you need certain industries to be closer to you, especially the healthcare uh, industry, food security is something that we are we are working on, and uh, we drill down in in, in these in these. Uh, uh special and i mean special in need industries and i will be talking about them after i answer your question regarding the icb the icb or the in country value is a measure of uh, how the partnership is working so whenever you have you have a, a manufacturing facility or you have an investor in the country you want to test how much value they add to your economy through the investments they put through the, the local purchase that they are doing the national employment that that they they deploy to the uh, to the economy and we are also uh, trying to help bringing more uh, industrial sector especially from the us to the united arab emirates and what more can help them than when you know that if you produce something in uae there is a commitment from everyone in their purchase to buy up to 40% from the local market and you become a local a local supplier so this is something that uh, started by adno and uh, now we are trying to upscale it to the to the nationwide there was some queries among the companies when we first implemented uh, uh, on the standard is it applicable to the other sectors in abu dhabi or the adno is abu dhabi going to have another system and i think today we have taken those questions we sit with the companies as a ministry and we sit with uh, with the uh, department uh, with uh, with abu dhabi uh, department of economy uh, uh, and, uh, and 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 adnoc and we sorted out those issues and now they they are working together uh, in, in one system and that that system has to be fair and we always will take uh, will take the the feedback from from the companies and improve the system but i think it's a system that build a stronger partnership talking about the us and 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 uae uh, i will mention an, an excellent example during this pandemic many countries were not concentrating on uh, on the uh, ppe or uh, or the equipments and we were i mean but they were just importing them. So here we have a state of art company called Strata, which is a Boeing, uh, an Airbus uh, supplier of, uh, of parts of the, of the, of the uh, latest airplanes. And now you have a disruption 
in this in this business. So what to do? We shifted uh, within 30 days from uh, from we shifted that manufacturing with collaboration of Honeywell, and we started uh, producing uh, state of art PPE with the uh, uh, with the uh, N95 masks. That was that was in need. And in no time, that facility that we had in Al Ain uh, have managed to to cater for up to 30 million masks per year. And this is a facility that was that has nothing to do with masks. So this is something that we did together with Honeywell. And there are so many other examples that that uh, that we can mention in in uh, in the in the partnership between between us and the U.S. company. In the future. We are trying in the ministry to uh, come up with a, with a, an industrial strategy that is focusing on the fourth industrial revolution technologies. That's the future. And in that, as you mentioned, uh, the, uh, the digitization is a critical uh, pivot in, in, that, in that transformation. The 3D printing is, is another, and we have a whole strategy for 3D printing. AI. Is AI is going to be crucial in transforming our, our industries. Uh, and uh, because of that importance, we started the first un dedicated university for AI, Muhammad bin Zayed AI University. And that's the first specialized university in artificial intelligence. The deployment of artificial intelligence have helped us in the medical field during the pandemic, have helped us in many areas of the business that we have done and to that we have a, a minister of state who's just focusing with his team on on the on the uh, on the uh, artificial intelligence so ai is going to change the way that we are doing things especially in the, in the oil and gas sector uh, the uh, the uh, so the icv the icv my prediction that the icv is going to be crucial not only in the oil and gas sector but it's going to be crucial in the future. Where are we going to concentrate? We will concentrate on the design phase of, of, the, of the products rather than just manufacture. Many countries can manufacture, but I think there are few countries who have the IP and the intellectual properties in the design. So that's an area that we would like to play a key role in, in the UAE. And also, uh, we would like to also to use our our infrastructure in catering for the uh, the industrial services, especially the digital services that the industries will need in the in the future. Those are, I think, the areas uh, of focus for our friends in the U.S. and you know Silicon Valley and 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 many of the institutions in the U.S. can can play a key role in that transformation that we are aspiring for. Thank you, Mr. Minister. That offers a very, very clear roadmap for the future for how American companies can partner uh, not only in the oil and gas sector, but broadly in the UAE. And we very much appreciate that. I'd now like to ask a close friend and colleague for many years, close advisor to me, uh, Sandy Lowe from Occidental Petroleum, uh, to ask uh, a question of you. And I know that Occidental is one of your closest, closest partners in the UAE, and uh, we appreciate that very much. Thank you. Sandy. Yes, Your Excellency, how do you see continued low oil prices of impacting a lower carbon future? Very good question, uh, Sandy. Uh, I think I think the uh, first of all, we need to be very careful in predicting what is going to be the oil price. Now, uh, we have two challenges, as you know. One challenge is the inventories level that we need to reduce to something closer to the five years average. We can only do that with, with a good pace if we try to control the production and, uh, and adjust. And this is something that we are trying to do, as I mentioned in the, in the deal. Uh, the uh, I think I think the uh, while the oil the low oil prices and the low uh, then the low gas prices as well. When we talk about oil, we forgot that the gas is now 1.7, 1.8 
dollars, which is also a uh, a, a significantly lower than probably even the cost of uh, production of some of those uh, LNG uh, that are produced in certain parts of the world. So this environment of low oil and gas prices, I don't think it's sustainable to to be to be to be long with us. I think we will go back to normal and hopefully sooner than many of the uh, predictions uh, or some of the people are predicting. This is, of course, depend on are we going to have a second wave or not? And this is this is a debate. And I hope not. I hope that that we will go back to normal and we will, of course, change the way that we uh, we uh, interact with each other. We have to use some sort of social distance. But I hope that we are not going to limit the travel and we will go back to uh, at least the consumption level that is reasonable. Now we are we are at a consumption level of back to 2013, believe it or not, after a, a yearly growth. So a low carbon uh, UAE is targeting to become a low carbon economy and a low carbon, a low energy, uh, low carbon energy uh, country. And uh, our plans did not change. This uh, this is something that that happened uh, in uh, because of the pandemic. We think things will go back to normal, either if they take a year or two. Countries, uh, Sandy, they need to have a rather longer te term policy when it comes to their transformation. The solar also is, uh, is, uh, is significantly, I mean, the late, latest solar projects are below two cents per kilowatt hour. So that is also encouraging. But when the gas is two cents, uh, is two dollars, uh, below two dollars, that is, I think, uh, something that 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 could could lead to uh, the transformation from coal for example to gas and that is good news for the transformation for lower uh, carbon footprint so hopefully the guys will be encouraging countries to uh, to shift to gas uh, who are on coal and those who are on uh, on gas they will be also introducing renewable energy and, and and trying to have to have that balanced mix between their different forms of energy, but uh, but that's that's something the the uh, I mean it depends on your on your forecast. If your forecast that you are going to stay in the low oil prices environment, the gas prices environment for long, then then I think that is going to to definitely affect the uh, the, uh, the the future of many of many of those uh, of those countries. Thank you, Mr. Minister, and great question, Sandy. Uh, let me turn to a regular participant in our uh, Global Energy Forum in Abu Dhabi, uh, Ambassador Paula Dobryowski. She's a former Under Secretary of State and a member of our board and vice chair of our uh, uh, the Atlantic Council Scowcroft Center. Paula. Thank you so much, uh, Minister, for, for joining us. And also, thank you so much for sharing with us what the UAE has done to deal with the pandemic and the kind of critical assistance that you've given other countries. Thank you for that. My question, I think, builds upon the question that also Sandy gave. What is your long-term strategy for maintaining reasonable prices in hydrocarbons? What if the oil demand starts to decline? How do you deal with that? And how does diversification fit into this picture? An excellent question, Paula, and uh, it's, uh, it's a great pleasure to see you, even uh, from a distance. <laughs> and we hope, we hope to see you, to see you in person. Uh, the, uh, I think, I think the, uh, first of all, UAE have taken a decision in terms of, of diversification of, of our economy. So I think diversification of economy, whenever you are hit with a lower oil, oil environment, countries go and form plans and start actioning on them. So I think all of the GCC countries are coming up with a very uh, good targets for, for, that, for that transformation toward a, a more balanced economy, rather than just focusing on, uh, on oil. Now, uh, the uh, Lower oil uh, environment, why I'm saying it's not going to last for long, even if the demand is softening, because there are producers who cannot sustain, who are there today at the, the, the prices of $60, $70. Uh, 
but they cannot be there if the oil prices are staying lower than uh, in, in the lower than forty dollars or forty dollars fifty dollars. So that is that is a territory where you will lose many of the marginal producers, and you will also lose some of the uh, of the investments that the invest the investors are putting in this sector. They will shift to other to other sectors. And we are we already have seen that in the shale oil, uh, uh, for example, especially in the independence, some of the some of the investors are, are asking for for a return, and they are shifting to to to, to other uh, to other uh, sectors, especially to the healthcare sector now. Now, uh, why the price is not the target for us? We're not targeting a certain price. We're targeting a sustainable supply, and to be able to sustain the supply. You need to convince the investors. I mean, if you look at the UAE, forty percent of our production is is uh, is coming from this partnership that we have done with the American companies and European and Asian companies. Those are our partners in, in, when it comes to production. If it doesn't make sense for them to invest, then countries and, and maybe not necessarily UAE, but other countries could could uh, could stop. The, uh, the development of those resources for the future. I mean, the pace of growth was almost a one million barrel and, and certain years more than that as a growth. And suddenly, because of the pandemic, we dropped 10 million or more than 10 million, uh, 15 million maybe in certain, certain months. But all of the forecasts the, uh, from the experts are saying we will go back uh, gradually to, uh, to where we were. We will go back not in three months or four months. Probably it will take longer. But with the cut that we have done with the OPEC Plus, we think we can maintain a reasonable level of investments to stay and support that sustainability of the supply. If that level of investments is not there, then we are going to have a, not an oil, low oil, oil environment, oil prices environment, we will have a shock in, in the oil environment if, if many countries shut down their production, do something else. So it's I think I think it's something that, that we need to take with, with some practical uh, forecast uh, rather than just uh, taking a, I mean a, a situation of, of saying we will we will start to see that decline much faster. Thank you, Mr. Minister, and thank you, uh, Paula, for that excellent question. I'd like to introduce Christian Lenoble now from ExxonMobil. ExxonMobil is a key partner for the UAE in the Upper, upper Zakam field uh, going forward. And Christian, over to you for what you would like to ask the minister. Oh, Your, Your Excellency, it's always a pleasure to listen to your insights. You have such a global view of the energy industry. Uh, in your opening remark, you, you mentioned the steep destruction in oil demand, uh, the impact on the investments, and, and also uh, some of the uh, panel uh, panelists have mentioned that it could impact uh, the uh, energy mix. Uh, with this uh, transformation, including the digital transformation, how critical do you see the partnership with the U.S. company in terms of the human capital, which is going to be necessary to support the required transformation of the energy industry? I think this is this is a critical uh, a critical area of cooperation. I mean, uh, the future is going to change. Now, if you look at education, for example, education have transformed from going to schools to uh, to, to to building uh, or those who have the benefit of having an infrastructure like us here in the UAE uh, manage to uh, to uh, have to use this platform and use it effectively. Now, the human capital in this sphere of development uh, is, is, is going to be, uh, to be with different skills. Uh, we, need, we need more of the likes of Zoom and, and other communication that will make us communicate better while we are, I mean, at home. So even the notion, people are saying the notion of having a job may change. You may have a part-time job while you are at home and having two or three jobs. The efficiency in, uh, I don't know about you guys, but the efficiency that we have seen 
uh, when going with 80% and 90% and even 100% uh, working from home uh, has been, uh, in my view, better in certain areas of the business, not in every, every, every aspect of the business, but in certain areas. So training and development of the human capital in these areas is, uh, is going to be an, an area for improvement. We, we spoke about some, uh, some of the technologies of the future that we need, we need, to, we need developers and, and we need to retrain some of those, of those human capital who are going to lose jobs to, to, uh, to, to do uh, or work in, in some of those jobs. And education become much easier now than when than it is when you guys have, have been uh, or, or, or ourselves have been have been uh, in universities. Now people attend uh, sessions and graduate uh, from from universities while they are working or doing doing other things. They don't have to travel. They don't have to attend classes in person. Uh, medium of communication have improved significantly. The speed of internet. So many things are changing. And I think uh, for, for the uh, oil and gas companies, they need to think globally now. They need to think as an energy player rather than just a, uh, a, I mean, a, a, a producer. One question uh, is the use of, uh, of uh, hydrocarbon, for example, and plastic and, and all of the things that we, we were uh, uh, thinking of that we will get rid of we, we will we will use less of now with this pandemic the use of plastic have increased significantly so this is something that no one was was seeing driving for example people are driving more in certain parts of the world today because they don't want to go to the public transportation no one was predicting this so these these uh, this pandemic i think have uh, have changed the way that we are looking at things things that was not critically important becomes very important and crucial, like the PPE, that no one was, was paying attention to, uh, to, to produce it. And, and I think that we are just at the beginning of understanding how is the future going to be. So we need to have more talk and we need, we need to, uh, we need definitely the human capital is going to be uh, the, uh, the power of this, of this transformation. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Minister. We have so many good questions. I hope we can get to as many of them as possible in this hour. Uh, I want to turn to um, another. It's almost as if we're back in Abu Dhabi of the Forum. I want to talk to another. Uh, turn to another regular speaker of the Forum, uh, Halima Croft, uh, Managing Director and Global Head of Commodity Strategy at RBC Capital Markets and an Atlantic Council board member. Thank you so much, Your Excellency, and thank you, Atlantic Council, for hosting yet again another great event at the Energy Center. Your Excellency, I want to ask you about investment in your oil spare capacity. UAE's production rose above 4 million barrels in April. How are you thinking about investing in spare capacity, and when do you actually think you may need to use that spare capacity? Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Halima. It's, it's good to see you as well, uh, uh, Halima. Uh, we have tested, I think, our our capacity uh, back in April when uh, when the production was uh, when there was no deal, and we reached, uh, I think, a new milestone, which is which was uh, 4.2 uh, million barrels per day. And as you know, our uh, our capacity is something that we will only use when. Uh, outside the deal or, or, or when needed. And uh, the, uh, the plans for going for the 5 million barrels capacity by 2030 is there. We think that uh, things will go normal. Uh, I think we will, uh, we will relook at that, at, that, at, that, uh, at that strategy. But I think if this pandemic is, uh, is over in one or two years, uh, we will see that some of the we will see some drop by some of the marginal producers in the coming years before 2030. You see, when you look at, at many of those of those countries who have reached uh, a uh, a good percentage of, of their of their resources extraction resources, then you know that you are not going to create uh, resources out of uh, out of the the blue and anything that any and and those. 
uh, unconventional resources are going to be more expensive. So we feel that 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 a reasonable priced uh, conventional oil is going to have the chance in the near future. 2030, I think, is not far away from us. It's 10 years, yes, but uh, but we are seeing a uh, a distortion of production during the past 10 years uh, from many uh, of uh, uh, permanent or, or prominent oil uh, oil producers that we don't see their production today. So the likes of, uh, of Venezuela, for example, Libya, because of the uh, of the unrest there, and many other countries who have lost uh, significant production, either because of sanctions or because of uh, of war or or, uh, or uh, uh, civil unrest. So there is no guarantee that something is not going to happen and uh, and distort distort the uh, the order of, of, of certain production. I mean, in the U.S., how much decline in the production happened in the U.S. during those three months? I mean, uh, who can if, if this if this is not a switch? A sw uh, I mean, a switch, uh, an on and off switch. You need. I mean, if you lose the service companies, it's going to take time to get them back. Yes, you can get that that production back, but it will take time. Meanwhile, you need someone to fill in that gap. Otherwise, we are going to have shocks. In the in the prices, and the last thing we want is to have shocks for for the economies. Uh, we are at a state where uh, we need to have stability, and uh, we've been defending that five years average uh, to have a reasonable and fair price. And we we never mention what is that price. That price when we have enough storage and we have enough interest in the investors to invest, I think that is, that is the environment that we, we, we want to be in. But no one was thinking of what, what happened to us in the past three months. Things happened. And I think the uh, UAE have a longer vision when it comes to, uh, to, the, uh, to building that, that spare capacity. And we think it will be utilized without distorting the, uh, the, uh, the order of the OPEC Plus and, and, and the, uh, the other producers. Thank, thank you, Mr. Minister. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to uh, try to get as many questions as we can. Anthony Paula uh, asks two questions. I can deliver them quickly. When will the uh, UAE's first nuclear plant be begin supplying to the grid? And secondarily, and this gets to the OPEC Plus uh, meeting you just had, where you were uh, quite um, positive about the outcomes of it. Uh, but his question is, what recourse do you have if people don't stand by their commitments? I'll take the first part, which is the easier part. <laughs> first of all, we are very proud of reaching uh, this milestone uh, where uh, mechanically our uh, our first plant is uh, is ready, and we got the uh, the permission to start the process of uh, of uh, of uh, the uh, the startup. Uh, this process, as you know, you have a regulator, and that regulator is always going to be there to ensure that the safety and security of uh, of the people and the plant is there. So it's a very thorough. And this is another partnership between us, Korea, and the U.S. that we are very proud of. And we are, we are, uh, we are on the spot to deliver the safest plant ever built by, by mankind. And we would like it to be a, a model for, for others who are going to, uh, to do it. So we are not in a rush to, uh, to, uh, to, 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 to deliver electricity. We have ample capacity utilizing the, uh, the, the gas turbines that we have. And we are on, on, on trajectory, on process to, uh, to, uh, to, start the, uh, to start the process. This, the, we started this year, we got uh, the, uh, the, uh, the license. And uh, recently, uh, uh, His Highness uh, have visited the, uh, the plant. Uh, and uh, we uh, we are encouraged by uh, the uh, by the support from the leadership. And what I can tell you that we are we are on plan. There is a very thorough process that that we are undertaking today. 
taking advice from the experts, nuclear experts, taking advice from our regulator and working with them, as well as from the uh, new for, from the uh, the uh, international nuclear uh, agency. So we're, we are working with everyone, and we are on this on this trajectory of the process. When exactly uh, I cannot I cannot tell you because because they they vet every step that you walk on. Uh, walk I mean uh, starting on a nuclear plant is not a walk on the park. So it's not it's not easy, and we are not going to start unless we are 100% confident of the safety and, and uh, of this plan. As I mentioned, we want this plan to be a model for others and uh, people spend years in this plan. But look at any nuclear plant built in, even not built from scratch, even if someone, some of the countries has it, no one had delivered a faster pace nuclear plant than our problem. And uh, I think we will remain to be the fastest, even taking those those uh, necessary steps that we are we are taking with uh, with our uh, with our regulator. Now shifting to the uh, to, to the other, I have confidence on on, on our colleagues, and I, I mentioned this maybe maybe earlier, uh, uh, Paula. Uh, the uh, when when a country come and say I will compensate for any barrel that I don't produce. Uh, that I don't cut in May, for example, and they have they have a, uh, they have a, a, all of their their rights to uh, not to agree to that if they elected not to do. I think when you have that, then you have a, a reasonable assurance that those those countries are committed. Uh, we are looking at the numbers now. JMMC will meet, as I mentioned, and JMMC job is to work with uh, with the with every country. And making sure that they deliver, but in the previous deal, that's that's I think the difference. In the previous deal, there has been countries who did not perform and did not make up those barrels because there there was no rule. This rule is a new rule. We insisted on having this rule to show the commitment from the countries, and and I think I think coming and, and stating their commitments, I think they are serious. This deal is until April twenty. 22. So we're not talking about a few months, then they will just go away. This deal is, is a rather medium term, and I'm confident that, that countries will, uh, will demonstrate uh, their, uh, their commitment in, in, in the coming months. Thank you, sir. Um, this question comes from uh, Emily Meredith at Energy Intelligence. She thanks you for this and uh, this session. She says, how can you ensure that the overcompensation mechanism will work? What, and what's the U UAE oil production expected to be this month? You may want to speak about that in general. Uh, and and, and um, uh, apart from China, do you think Asian oil demand will come back? And if so, where might it be strongest? Uh, first of all, uh, the mechanism. I think the JMMC is going to discuss uh, discuss the mechanism. The deal itself has the mechanism. I mean, when 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 every country said we gave them three months, so we said uh, in May and June, if you don't conform, if the conformity level is not 100% in May and June, then a country can compensate in in uh, July, August, and maximum in September. And that gives you, I mean, if you look at it, uh, let's say the conformity levels is 85% or 90%. If you take a 10, 20% a or 15% of the 10 million or 9.7 million, and then take it to the next month, that's like an extension of, uh, or, or, or an extra cut that, 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 you, are, that you, are, you are seeing in that specific month. So I think, I think the, the, the mechanism is there, the, the number of months are there. Uh, I think uh, JMMC and his his Royal Highness uh, Prince Abdul Aziz uh, is a very capable uh, chair, together with uh, Alexander, uh, with His Excellency Alexander Nova. I think they will uh, they will uh, they will work out with those countries and they will ensure that everyone is is uh, is delivering on their commitment. And as I told you, I have confidence on uh, the commitments of those of those countries. Uh, coming to the second uh, question which is uh, 
Remind me what was the second question, if you, if you may. The second question was Asian demand, uh, aside from yes. China, where you see it picking up. And, and also yes. in general, the, the uh, US oil production uh, level, UAE oil production level. Yes, uh, UAE uh, uh, in June, I mean, that's the question was about this month. Uh, and in June, uh, we, we have committed to cut uh, an extra 100,000 barrels than, than the cut. So we are expected to perform uh, uh, the, uh, the cut that, that, that we have been allocated, plus the 100,000 that, that, uh, that has been voluntarily uh, committed by UAE. So that is uh, and the level of the level of UAE uh, or the level of the cut of UAE. It's supposed to be supposed to produce two million four hundred sixty-four uh, uh, thousand uh, barrels. So uh, back to to the demand. Uh, demand we have seen very good signs of, of demand pick up. We have seen that the travel uh, between I mean inside the countries, be it China, be it India, have start to come. We have seen as well uh, numbers of the uh, of the driving vehicles and the demand on the on the products picking up, which means people are are driving more, uh, not uh, using much of uh, using the public transportation. But there are some uh, sector of the population are prefer to uh, to to drive. So that we have seen, we have seen it even even picking up in Europe. So those are the good signs. Uh, now, what level are we going to go to? Uh, is uh, it depends on on which estimates are going are, are you going to believe? There are uh, pessimistic. There is the uh, people who are who are more optimistic. But I think looking at, at different scenarios, we uh, we feel unless we have another wave of uh, of, of the uh, COVID uh, COVID nineteen a second wave, I think we will we will see uh, the demand recovery. Uh, at a pace that is adequate to the cut that we have done as, as an OPEC plus, provided that also the other producers, they don't rush quickly and overproduce. And so they, there, there need to be a discipline among the other producers as well, if we are serious about uh, coming back to, uh, to, the, uh, to the supply and demand balance. Thank you. So we only have um, you know five or six minutes left to us, but let me uh, throw three questions at you, and you can pick which of these uh, you 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 would like to take on. You think it's worth taking on. One of them is from Javier Font, and he's asking about your views toward green hydrogen and its contribution to the energy transition. Um, the other is uh, is really a question uh, uh, for the. Um, uh, where the energy mix is going from anonymous question after nuclear picks up and what role is gas. But this is my favorite question, Mr. Minister, uh, which is from Mohammed Faisal Yunus. When will oil prices reach $100 per barrel? Uh, and I think behind that question is, will they ever again be at that price? And uh, I would add, what is the Goldilocks band? What is the not too hot, not too cold, perfect band that you see? Okay, I think I think the two questions, the first two questions, are related to the energy, to the to the future, future energies, and the energy, the the, the energy mix, the, the greener forms of energy mix. Uh, and the second question is about uh, the uh, the question on on the on the uh, on uh, on the oil price. So the first two, green hydrogen uh, or any new form of of, uh, of energy, is going to uh, to, to go through the, 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 the base, I think, of, of, of proving itself against the economics. People were questioning the renewable energy when the prices were very high and said it doesn't make sense that they can compete with, uh, with a base load. But we have seen a combination that made, that made sense. And then uh, an improvement in the technology. Uh, hydrogen, as uh, compared to gasoline, for example, or compared to, uh, to uh, uh, I mean, a hydrogen cell in a car or, or transportation or converting, uh, converting solar to, uh, to, to hydrogen, all of those are new projects. And uh, I think like the electrical vehicles, they will have their chance, they will come, they will, uh, they will flourish in certain markets, but 
the infrastructure is, is the question. Who is going to invest in the infrastructure for any new form of, uh, of energy? That happened during the, uh, the early stage of the renewable energy, and we've been, we've been through that cycle. So I think it will take time, but these, we, we need creativity when it comes to the greener forms of energy. Uh, I think the, the uh, mankind in the future, we will have much more people and we will, our consumption, even if we reduce our consumption, the demand is going to be, to be high in the, in the if, you, if you talk 10, 20 years, oil and gas are finite resources. So definitely we need something to rely on in the future. And, that, and we need to be reasonable in the pace of that transition. We need not to be uh, unrealistic and say that oil is, is, is not going to be needed and it's going to be left and suddenly we will shift to another form of energy. We will have a transition and that transition historically take time and take efforts uh, as well. And, come up, and, and every transition or every form of energy have also some consequences like the, uh, the batteries now. I mean, people are talking about if we have uh, battery technology, then we will solve all of the problems. But what are we going to do with the batteries? How are we going to recycle these uh, millions uh, of, of batteries if we, if we shift to, uh, to, uh, to batteries uh, technologies? So many questions. I think the question is, it will take its space. It needs to compete with the other forms on the scale of commerciality. Uh, when oil be $100, do we? Uh, actually want to uh, to have a focus on a price i mean if if that is the aim then countries can curtail their production and and can push the oil to 100 dollars i don't think that is that is the aim because if the oil is at 100 dollar then the uh, at the state of economy where we are in today then i think that is opening the door for other forms of energy to uh, to kick in and and and, and compete so I think uh, what we require is a balanced uh, approach toward the, uh, the, the, the commerciality of the new resources. We have a more challenging resources than the resources we extracted in the past. I think any, any expert in the oil and gas will tell you when we have experts with us, like Sandy and others who are dealing with some of the most sophisticated reservoirs, uh, be it sour or be it tight. So the cost is not, is not uh, easy to control all the time. And if, if we have a shock, then, then uh, countries will, uh, will be shying away from, this, from this, uh, this form and they will go and seek other forms of, of energy. But also if the price is so low, then we could have the risk of a shock because people are not going to be produced. That's why countries like UAE, are trying to invest in the spare capacity to be able to come and put those barrels when needed and avoid having shocks uh, in in the in the uh, in the uh, demand when uh, when the oil is not available. Uh, many other countries, I think, are doing. The U.S. have, have spent tremendously in developing its shale oil uh, resources, and we wish them good luck uh, in in starting. Uh, uh, again, at the right time, and I think there will be a right time for everyone to go back. We just need to be patient, and we just need to work together, collaborate, and we can uh, we can uh, withstand this pressure, uh, and this pandemic will be over, uh, hopefully, and we can live our lives, see each other, and uh, and uh, enjoy a better economy. Your Excellency, this was just a wonderful conversation. We had terrific questions. We often say at the Atlantic Council that we don't believe in the world word social distance. It's geographic distance, but we can come socially closer together this way. Um, uh, I want to thank Randy Bell and his Global Energy Center team. They just really are the best in the business. And speaking of the best in the business, I want to pass back to Danny Seabright to bring us home. Well, you have to, yeah. Thank you so much, Fred. Um, just want to say thank you to His Excellency and his team in the UAE. I want to say thank you to all that the UAE has been doing uh, to help battle the COVID-19 crisis and pandemic. We all look forward to a world uh, where we can see each other again soon face to face. 
and to all the panelists on the uh, webinar today. Appreciate your time and interest and, uh, and participation. With that, I just want to conclude by a, a big round of thanks to everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you.